first and foremost, I want to uh, thank uh, NSCA TSAC for having me here. Um, I'm a little disappointed, though. Tyler told me there was a best dress competition for a TSAC facilitator, and I was told later that wasn't true. Um, so that's what I was going uh, for. Uh, so t today we're going to talk about sunshine and sushi, two of my favorite things. Um, the, the reason behind this is been doing some research, uh, looking into uh, omega-3 fatty acids and, and vitamin D with the tactical athletes, and I think this is a, a definitely an, an issue um, that, that we can affect to improve performance, especially you know me as a, a, a performance dietitian. So the outline, what we'll talk about, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D in the body, some of the roles they play, um, the threat uh, for insufficiency and deficiency, uh, looking at some of the studies uh, in the tactical athlete population along with the civilian sector. Some of the benefits of optimal levels uh, through research that, that's been demonstrated. And then some strategies for implementing a plan, obviously, to, to correct those, those deficits. So when you guys leave here, you know, you can uh, have a plan to, to apply to the athletes that you currently work with. So Poseidon, everybody familiar with Poseidon? Greek god, the sea. You know, he's got uh, uh, his, his spear, great hair, great physique. He was known for his power. He could shake the earth. Well, one of Poseidon's secrets, maybe, is, you know, he's in the ocean there swimming around with those omega-3 fatty acids affecting that muscle, as we're about to find out. Also, when we look at um, omega-3 fatty acids and cognition, um, Poseidon had his chariot, and his chariot was pulled by hippocampus. Hippos meaning horse and campus meaning monster, so it was a, basically a seahorse. Well, if you think of the hippocampus in the brain, which is shaped like a seahorse, uh, DHA also affects that. So it all goes back to Poseidon. So one of the, the, the questions that, that you know, I get a lot, and I think other dietitians probably too, is, well, I take flax. I know that gets converted, so you know, am I good to go if I just do some flax? And so flax is the alpha linolenic acid, the ALA. And so it, it can get converted to the uh, eicosapatinoic acid, which I will now say EPA each time. I'm Southern Georgia guy, it's hard to do this. Docasohexanoic acid, which I will now refer to as DHA. So, so that can get converted. But um, in, in a good paper there, I've got cited at the bottom, Gerster found that only 6% uh, ALA got converted to EPA and about 3.8% um, to DHA. And if you ever look at lipid metabolism, look at all the steps involved, uh, it becomes abundantly clear that that's not an efficient process. And partly because our diet dictates that. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, the, the ALA or then the um, linoleic acid, the omega-6, uh, and you look at their processes, it's kind of a race for the 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 omega-6 to get to arachidonic acid, and then the ALA to get to EPA, and both of them have to go through a, a desaturase uh, process, and they're competing for that. They're competing for that uh, desaturase. And so everybody's probably aware, you know, the typical American diet, very high in omega-6, so the omega-6 is gonna win that race. So, you know, especially if you have uh, someone who, who takes in a lot of omega-6, um, they're not gonna get a good conversion. So, so flax isn't a good option. Now, what about omega-3 fatty acids in the tactical athlete? So a great study by Dr. Uh, Mike Lewis. Um, from, he took uh, samples from the blood repository from 2002 from two, uh, to 2008 of 800 uh, suicide samples and then matched it to 800 non-suicide samples. And so for each standard deviation decrease in DHA, it was a 14% more likelihood increase and that group being in the suicide group. Towards the end there, if you were in the, the lowest level, those with the lowest level of DHA, they were 62% more likely to be in the suicide group. So again, this isn't cause and effect, this is just a relationship, but still, with, with that sample size and those numbers, um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing to note. Uh, in another study by Johnston, they looked at 78 soldiers uh, deployed to Iraq, and these soldiers were uh, reporting to uh, behavioral health. They looked at the omega-3 index, and what the omega-3 index is is just where you take EPA, you add it to DHA, and that, that gives you the index. It's usually a measure for uh, cardiovascular health, as we'll discuss later. The omega-3 index 
Um, they didn't see any uh, improvements in anxiety or depression, measure, uh, depression measures. Uh, however, they saw improvements in cognitive flexibility and executive function. And the greatest improvement were in the soldiers who were sleep deprived. So, you know, Dr. Harvey talked a little about the creatine research in, in sleep deprivation. Um, this might be another avenue to look at. And again, we know with tactical athletes, uh, sleep is important. You can't replace sleep, but we're always looking for ways to mitigate because we know sleep deprivation is uh, going to occur. So this kind of uh, points maybe in that direction. There's also a lot of research with uh, omega-3 fatty acids as uh, potential uh, prophylactic for traumatic brain injuries. This was a paper by uh, Dr. Mike Lewis and then Julian Bells. And Dr. Bells, you might recognize that name if you remember a few years back in West Virginia with the Sago Mine incident where the miners were trapped. And there was one miner who um, was down there for an unknown period without oxygen. Uh, they, they pulled him uh, out. He was basically in a coma. Uh, a few months later, he was able to walk out of the hospital. Uh, miraculous re recovery. And I mean, they did the hyperbaric chamber, a lot of other treatments, but one of the treatments uh, they did, um, they pumped about 20 grams of uh, omega-3 fatty acid per day uh, down his feeding tube. Because um, again, the DHA is a main component in the brain to kind of rebuild that. And uh, since then, uh, there has also been another case, uh, Sanjay Gupta covered it, uh, with a teenager who was in a car wreck. Uh, Dr. Mike Lewis was uh, um, consulted with that, the same sort of thing the teenager ended up being able to go to prom. Um, now, these are case studies because, as you can imagine, it, it's hard to, you know, the IRB won't let anybody uh, give a human uh, traumatic brain injury and then, an, you know, non and, and give them omega-3 fatty acids. So most of these are in animal models, but with all the animal models, it points to effectiveness. And then with the case studies, uh, we do see effectiveness. So, uh, again, this is something that maybe we can manipulate to help our soldiers who are at risk for traumatic brain injuries. But this is the NSCA, so let's talk about the muscle. How do omega-3 fatty acids affect the muscle? So this was a, a five-week experiment involving steers. They included omega-3 fatty acids in the feeding, and they found you know, it increased uh, protein synthesis. So that's a good thing, right? However, it's steers. But what about humans? Well, Smith, uh, they did a study in both a geriatric population and a young population. So they had older adults and then young middle age. They did either eight weeks of corn oil, which was the placebo, or four grams of fish oil. And what they found is, whether you're young or whether you're old, the omega-3 fatty acid improved protein synthesis. Another study, using 44 men and women um, around 34 years of age, four grams a day per uh, safflower oil or four grams of fish oil for six weeks, the fish oil group gained more muscle mass, uh, lost uh, uh, fat, and a tendency, although didn't reach uh, uh, statistical significant significance uh, for cortisol levels. So it seemed to kind of blunt uh, the effect of cortisol. But still, you know, more muscle, less fat. Pretty good stuff. It's starting to look like Poseidon. The omega-3 fatty acids also appear to be anticatabolic. So some of the talks, like Dr. Kramer's talk, um, you know, mentioned how uh, tactical athletes a lot of times can be in a catabolic state, high stress, uh, maybe the, the nutrition's not adequate, not getting enough adequate calories. So now this was done in a, a Petri dish, I will point that out, but they were in a, a, a cells replaced, muscle cells replaced in a starvation state, um, and then either, you know, got a placebo uh, of just, I think it was water, and then, or they put EPA, and EPA reduced the breakdown of the cells by 22%. So again, um, it's, it's a, a potential now we're seeing that maybe, you know, if that tactical athlete's in an environment where they have caloric restriction, omega-3 fatty acids might help uh, stave off um, some of the catabolic responses to that. But what about strength, you know, because we care about performance. Study of 45 women, uh, this is an older group. Um, one group either strength trained the other group uh, strength trained and got a fish oil supplement of 2 grams a day for 90 days. The other uh, fish oil supplement of 2 grams a day for 150 days. In that group, it was 60 days leading up to the 90-day strength training. So they kind of had a preload before they got into it. Um, knee flexor, extensor, plantar, dorsiflexor muscles all increased in all groups, obviously, from the training. 
but the, uh, the fish oil supplementation had the higher peak torque. Um, but the group that, that went longer, that had the 60-day the preload, didn't get any more benefit from it. So it seemed kind of for this study that the 90 days was, was adequate. And what about the tactical athlete? So there's no standardized levels that we look for for DHA and EPA. So the only thing we really have kind of that's standardized is the omega-3 index, which looks at cardiovascular risk. So this was 100 male soldiers um, in a support battalion at Fort Hood. Uh, this is uh, part of the research I'm uh, collected at Texas A&M. And so we analyzed their uh, omega-3 fatty acid levels. And this is kind of a breakdown of their omega-3 index. And so how the omega-3 index works is you're either at high uh, cardiovascular risk, moderate cardiovascular risk, or low cardiovascular risk. So kind of as a reference range to see what you know, omega-3 fatty acid levels are in soldiers, out of these 100 we used at Fort Hood, Texas, we had one who was low risk. So again, in this population, we see that you know, omega-3 fatty acids probably aren't optimal, which you know, makes sense for probably most of us in here. If, you, if you've been in the military, um, they've yet to develop the sushi MRE. Um, you know, a lot of times DFACs, um, especially in the deployed setting, Fish might not be a regular option. Um, so as we expected, we're seeing low omega-3 fatty acid levels in this population. Uh, this question um, was, was thrown out in some of the omega-3 uh, stuff that I'm citing here. It was discussed in a journal, a uh, special issue of the military medicine, where they looked at nutritional armor for the warfighter. And they basically broke down all the different benefits from you know, the muscle to the performance to the brain. And then at the end, they discussed some of the challenges of getting omega-3 uh, fatty acids into the, the military food supply. Um, so up here for reference, I, I recommend if, if you're interested in omega-3 fatty acids with a tactical athlete, uh, getting your hands on a copy, it's really good. But I woke up this morning and I was uh, searching to see if any updates uh, had come available. And uh, sure enough, there was, because they were talking about the, the difficulties in getting omega-3 fatty acids in the MRE because they are a polyunsaturated fatty acid, so those oxidize really rapidly, so they break down. So in this study, um, and, and this was done uh, by uh, Dr. Tracy Smith, so this is kind of the, the Army feeding arm, they did 600 milligrams of encapsulated DHA and EPA, and they either put it in a fresh product or then they had another product that was stored for six months at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So trying to simulate that breakdown that maybe that MRE would see um, if utilized. They had a low protein option, which was cake, and then they had a high protein option, which was a meat stick. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? So what they had is they had 14 volunteers. They consumed one item per week. It was randomized for four weeks, and then they just test the blood levels to see you know, is it getting in the blood? I thought that was pretty nice. Uh, instead of, you know, testing the product, they're actually seeing, hey, is, is it getting, you know, where we want it to go? And there was no appreciable difference um, with, with the ones that were fresh to stored. So it appears that they've cracked that code. And so now we can start seeing some more omega-3 fatty acid enriched uh, products out there. Now, I would have loved to talk to the uh, volunteers to see, you know, did the cake taste like fish? But, uh, you know, in, in, until it, gets, it comes out, uh, we won't know. But, but still, it looks like they're, they're headed in the right direction. It looks like these products hopefully will be uh, available soon. So transitioning over to, to talk a little bit about vitamin D, going back to a little Greek mythology, you have uh, Apollo. So he's the, the sun god, uh, you know, powerful guy, great, great bow hunter. Um, but also he was known for uh, healing capacity um, and some of the, the, the healing effects uh, that, that was provided uh, from the sun. And I don't know if anybody was in Paul Goldberg's talk, but uh, I have to use that. You know, he was talking about uh, some hockey players going uh, to the tanning bed before a game and having, you know, the performance of their career. And I'm thinking, it's the sun right there. It's that vitamin D. Um, so again, uh, you know, this, the vitamin D effect we can look back to Apollo. So looking at vitamin D and what's been seen in tactical athletes, this was the same sample that was used uh, in the earlier Dr. Lewis omega-3 fatty acid. This was led by, by Umau. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
but they did the whole 495 uh, non-suicide samples versus 495 suicide samples. It was a stretch a bit, so the lowest octile had a lower risk, but it wasn't as nice. It wasn't like a, a linear regression like we saw with, with DHA. Um, so as far as the vitamin D and suicide link, uh, you know, th there has been some studies with, with vitamin D and depression and those sort of things, but it goes back to is the chicken or the egg? Is the person depressed so they don't go outside? Or, you know, do they not go outside because they're depressed? That sort of thing. However, the, the key point I want to point out 30% of the samples, of those 900 samples, uh, were below uh, the, the recommended level. So they were either uh, insufficient or deficient. So, so that's a, a pretty big number. Now if we look at uh, Dr. Laurel Wentz, she looked at 314 soft personnel, looked at their vitamin D levels. What we saw here is 50% of the samples were insufficient um, to deficient in the soft personnel. So again, we just saw 30% with Umau, now we're seeing 50%. Um, this is, you know, uh, more recent, it was uh, in, in SOMA, or in the JSON, the Journal of Special Operations Medicine in 2013. So, you know, I was looking for some new studies this morning, and, and I want to point out, um, you know, the second author on there, uh, Karen Daigle, uh, didn't tell me about this study that she took part in, you know, but I did find the slides this morning, but she's back, so if you have any questions, she's back in the back, so we can ask her right there, but uh, no, that's great. But so they looked at, and she can correct me if I, if I mess this up, uh, 314 active duty soldiers in the overweight program. 69% of the, the cases were classified as obese. They were in the overweight program. 21% uh, were vitamin D deficient. And then 51% were vitamin D insufficient. Uh, so again, as you can see, these, these three studies uh, dealing with, uh, you know, tactical athletes, we're, we're seeing a trend here, which, which makes good sense as far as if you look at um, sun exposure, most of the time you got a uniform on, so you're not getting a lot of that. I mean, like uh, the guys I did, you know, you'd think that was Fort Hood, Texas. I think this was done in El Paso. Is that correct? So yeah, this is in El Paso. Both places are, are high sun, so imagine those soldiers in Alaska. Or, you know, with the soft personnel, what we think about is, you know, imagine you're in a deployed setting, reverse cycle, you're only going out at night, that sort of thing. What are, what are their vitamin D levels? So again, there, there's definitely an issue here uh, with this population. But what about the muscle? So uh, two good reviews uh, looking at, at vitamin D in the muscle, um, associated with muscle mass, associated with strength, and then there's a vitamin D receptor in the muscle, which, which is very interesting considering, you know, there's, there's not a vitamin C receptor in the muscle, but there's a vitamin D. So, you know, vitamin D kind of is almost uh, plays a role both a vitamin and, and a hormone. And so you, you get kind of a genetic uh, factor in there with vitamin D because they've looked at animal models, and in animal models that did not have a, have a vitamin D receptor, the muscle fibers were 20% smaller. So obviously we know that vitamin D is, is playing a critical role uh, in muscle function, and we'll uh, talk about what that might be a little later on in the slides. So they, they did a, uh, this is another Petri dish study, again, kind of giving you some of the backgrounds. Um, the myoblasts were incubated. Uh, vitamin D uh, increased uh, the VEGF, the, the FGF. So these are um, potent growth factors. That, that, that's good, you, you want those increased. And then these are, these are um, the ones that usually uh, blunt growth. Uh, so you want those decreased. So, you know, what we can take from this, it, it, it appears vitamin D is actually a, a myostatin inhibitor. Um, so that's, that's part of the, the role that it can help uh, with that muscle growth. It's another um, uh, animal model study. So they, they had rats, um, either they had a sedentary group, high intensity exercise, or high intensity exercise um, with a vitamin D uh, supplementation. So the high-intensity exercise defined was 30 minutes a day on the treadmill, five days a week, and they trained them up to, to where they were running uh, 30 um, uh, meters a minute at a three-degree incline. So little rats were just getting after it. So what they found is, um, this is a Korean study, the, the rats, given the vitamin D, had a significantly decrease in the markers of muscle damage. So again, we, we had talked about, about 
some of the factors in there in the myostatin inhibition, but it also looks at that vitamin D, you know, when we go through a stressful event, it might preserve that muscle mass. Now, I converted it to see what it would be kind of in a human population. I uh, know we're not rats, but, but still, so that would just be uh, about a 1,000 a IUs uh, per day would, would be that dose. So that might be, you know, something if you have guys going through a difficult training cycle, uh, you're not monitoring vitamin D, you know, this is, this is something to look at. And kind of along, along those same lines as far as vitamin D uh, protecting the muscle breakdown, especially during, you know, like running, this was a study done uh, by Willis where they had 19 uh, healthy ultra, uh, or, or pardon me, endurance trained males and females, and they looked at some of the, the markers, the TNF-alpha, um, the, the IL-4, the IL-10, some of those uh, inflammation markers in the muscle. And they looked at a regression analysis, comparing those to the vitamin D level. And so what they found is there was significant association between vitamin D level and, and TNF-alpha. So the higher the vitamin D level, the, the lower uh, the TNF-alpha. So lower uh, the markers of inflammation. However, it didn't have a significant uh, relationship with the other markers. So again, kind of pointing towards some of the mechanisms of, of how vitamin D might both enhance and preserve uh, performance. And again, this is interesting. Um, this isn't a tactical athlete population, but if you look at a lot of the vitamin D research, people are either deficient or insufficient. Um, so in this sample, 42% of the participants were uh, insufficient. So again, this, this seems to be you know, throughout the population. It's a study uh, done in California, so you think they're getting a lot of vitamin D, 16 to 20 uh, years of age, females. Um, vitamin D was significantly uh, associated with uh, lower muscle fat. So as vitamin D uh, levels went up, uh, there was lower muscle fat. But again, this is in California, 59% of the subjects were vitamin D deficient. 24% were clinically deficient, or pardon me, insufficient. 24% was clinically deficient. So even in California, an area you would think they're getting enough sun, going to the beach, that sort of thing, we're seeing those levels. So again, just the, the sun exposure um, appears to be not enough. What about hormone levels? So in a study about 2,300 men from 97 to, to 2,000, they looked at testosterone, free androgen index, and then steroid hormone binding globulin. And what they found is the individuals who had vitamin D over the 30 nanograms per milliliter had the higher testosterone levels. That, that's kind of important for the men in here, right? So again, um, uh, Dr. Kramer, when he's talking about overtraining and that sort of thing, we see the decreased uh, uh, testosterone levels. So anything that can possibly ameliorate that um, is a good thing. And, and vitamin D, as I said earlier, is not just a vitamin. It appears to have some of that hormone effect. Um, so optimizing a tactical athlete's vitamin D level, we might be able to preserve uh, some of those uh, hormone levels. What about strength? So this was done in an older population. They either got a calcium uh, placebo or a vitamin D for six months. Uh, the vitamin D group increased hip flexor strength, uh, knee extensor strength, and this was with no strength training. No strength training, they just got stronger. I know, you know you're thinking, ah, tactical athlete, old people, where does that come into play? But you know, here's a population, uh, no strength training. And what's more interesting, if you look at the study, this was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. During, and it went through the summer months. So these aren't vitamin D deficient people. So this, this is a group that, you know, is in an area that's getting a lot of sun. It went through the summer months. They, their vitamin D levels should be at their peak. And yet, when they uh, supplemented uh, this group, they saw an increase in strength despite no training. So, again, even though that's in a, a geriatric population, I thought it was interesting to kind of point that out. Here's another study that's a little more, uh, you know, in, in the age range we're, we're probably looking at in here. Uh, 419 healthy men and women. They did an isometric, isokinetic uh, strength in both arms and legs. And vitamin D levels were associated with both arm and leg strength when controlling for age and gender. So, uh, again, we're, we're seeing in this, you know, in this age range of this population, vitamin D being able uh, to be associated directly with the performance, directly with the strength. But what about performance? So this was a study uh, done in Greece, uh, 16 male soccer players. 
Um, so what they had is they had a, a six-week training camp. And so the researchers took vitamin D samples and then did their pre-camp tests, took vitamin D samples at the end, and did their post-camp test. So you guys probably do something similar with your training programs. Vitamin D was significantly associated with all the pre-camp test performance and all the post-camp test performance. And as you can see, here's some of the pre uh, jump squat, counter movement jump, 10 meter sprint, 20 meter sprint, and peak VO2. All significantly associated with vitamin D levels pre-camp. Remain the same post-camp. You can see that you know, the, the R values post-camp uh, uh, dropped a little bit uh, for that, but still significant. Um, so, you know, th this is a really nice study as we're seeing the actual applicability that, that this is applying to, to sports performance, to, to power output, um, to cardiovascular endurance. So what about Fort Hood? So in the sample of 100 soldiers I, I did at Fort Hood, we also looked at vitamin D levels. and 16% of the sample was deficient. 44% was insufficient, and then 40% was optimal, which, which we're defining as 30 nanograms uh, per milliliter. So again, Fort Hood, Texas, a lot of sun in Texas, uh, but, but still, even in this population, uh, we're seeing uh, low vitamin D levels. What about performance? Uh, we also put these soldiers through uh, a cognitive battery, which I want to uh, present here. It's still being written up. That'll, that'll be later. Um, uh, but we also did an APFT, which was our physical performance measure. It's what the, the Army, uh, you know, uses currently. And what was interesting is push-ups were positively correlated with EPA. The R value is not huge. I got it. But who would think that, you know, uh, fish, you know, basically fish oil would be associated with, with how many push-ups you can do? And then sit-ups were uh, both uh, positively correlated with EPA and DHA. And then run times were negatively correlated with vitamin D. So the guys with the, the higher vitamin D levels had faster run times. Um, and, and it's kind of a, a, a preview. I will say that with the cognitive battery we, lo we looked at, we were, we were seeing similar results with, with those levels as far as cognitive performance. Um, so again, you know, we, we've kind of looked at some of the mechanisms that might be involved here. Uh, we come back, we look at the levels in the tactical athletes, and now we actually have, you know, showing that the tactical athletes with higher levels of this tend to perform better physically. So trying to put this all together, um, one of the, the key takeaways I want you to take away from this is, you know, you can't get your omega-3 fatty acids from flax. Uh, that, that's just not a, a good... Uh, um, avenue. So when you look at getting your omega-3 fatty acids, you want to make sure it's, it's an EPA, a DHA, whether that comes from an actual, you know, fish oil, whether it comes from sushi, um, or, you know, an algae-based or a krill-based, um, whatever. But you want that EPA and DHA. Um, the conversion rate's just, just not there, not efficient enough. The American Heart Association recommends about 1,000 a, a milligrams a day, uh, EPA and DHA. Again, that's for optimal cardiovascular health. Um, but when we looked at actually the, the studies, many of the intervention studies looking at performance, it was around two to, to five grams uh, per day. Um, you know, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, one of the great things is, is you're not looking at, you know, I, I've yet to read a case study where anybody OD'd on fish oil. You know, it, it's, it's uh, uh, you're probably not gonna get to hit that threshold um, I would say the, 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 high, the, the worst adverse, you know, effect in, in that range probably you see is, is lower triglycerides, which, you know, probably isn't bad for, for some. Um, so, again, it's kind of a, a low risk, high reward when, when we look at, um, you know, the benefits. About six ounces of salmon gives you around three grams to kind of put it in reference. The, the cool thing about that is when we look at vitamin D, um, we can also see that in, in those fatty fish, that's where uh, also a good source of vitamin D. Um, besides that, once, once you get away from fish, uh, you know, it's, it's probably fortified milk, that sort of thing. But vitamin D is probably a lot harder to get enough of 
compared to the omega-3 fatty acid if you eat fish. Now, if you're somebody who doesn't eat fish, then it's going to be more difficult. Then that's where, you know, maybe uh, supplementation. Um, for the, the recommendations of vitamin D, we're going to use, I, I do want to point this out, the, uh, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. There is some difference. I, I didn't um, put the, go into the whole discussion on this, but there is a difference between the Institute of Medicine's recommendations on vitamin D and uh, the JCEM's uh, recommendations. Um, I'm going with the, the JCEMs because I felt like their review, and, and you can look at all this online, is, is more geared towards performance where the Institute of Medicine was just more to kind of prevent rickets. Um, and, and I know the, uh, the JCEM is what uh, is used in like the military ALTA system if you look at the levels, like the reference range, um, whenever a, a, a medical provider um, looks at the reference range on the labs. It's the JCEM's uh, uh, reference ranges. And so for that, they're looking at 600 IUs a day of vitamin D to maximize bone health, and they point out muscle function, because that's what we want. To raise levels to consistently above 30 nanograms per milliliter, you want to get around 1,500 to 2,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. And that would be something, you know, to work with uh, your provider. If you've got a doc who's working with you, you can monitor to see to, to get it up to those upper levels. Uh, you know, a lot of studies on, on vitamin D as far as dosing. And, you know, you, you, vitamin D, you, you really got to try uh, to, to get to the upper tolerable limit. You'd have to take a lot of vitamin D. But, but it's still there, and it's still possible um, so you don't want to get too cavalier with your, your vitamin D dosing. Um, there, there are a lot more than, than this, you know, people using a lot more than this, um, but this is, you know, what's been shown, you know, safe and effective. You can get your levels up to, to 30 nanograms a, a milliliter, and I haven't seen any studies that really show once you get past 30 nanograms a milliliter, you get any more benefit, um, you know, and, and, it, and they might show that as more research comes out, but right now, it kind of seems that if you get up to that 30 na uh, nanograms a milliliter and keep it up there, uh, which is, I think, is because sometimes you see it reported in uh, nanomoles uh, uh, per milliliter. I think it's 75 little conversion. Um, so. so when we're looking at, you know, does everybody remember Milo of Croton, that story? So, you know, uh, Milo of Croton, um, probably, you know, responsible for, for why we're in this uh, room right here because he's the first guy to come up with progressive resistance training. So, uh, you know, he started out carrying his, his calf. Then as the calf got heavier and uh, heavier, he got stronger. What you probably don't know is Milo of Croton was also a tactical athlete. Um, he actually, the Crotons were outnumbered three to one against the Sybarites. And he led the charge, famously, just wearing a lion skin and a club in his hand and led him to victory. So, you know, not only the, the guy to uh, discover progressive resistance, uh, also, uh, you know, a, a good tactical athlete and warrior. Now, although most point to Milo for his progressive resistance, if we look where uh, Croton was and where it is modern day, what do you see there? Lived on the sea, plenty of fish. Plenty of sunshine. So again, I would argue that, that Milo's success, although progressive resistance training uh, could be attributed to it, Milo is getting plenty of sunshine and plenty of sushi. That was pretty quick, um, but I will now open the floor uh, for, for questions. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if I've, I've seen that study. Was it in nanograms or nanomoles? I have to go. I would have to look up that paper, but, but I haven't seen. I know there was 
uh, a, this was a, a few years back, there were some issues um, with a, a major lab company that was doing vitamin D that we all probably know the name of. Um, and and the, the technique that was being utilized um, caused some, some errors. I know, you know, as we know is what you do in the lab, but, but I don't know about the calculation. I, I'd have to look into that. The D3, yeah, it, it w would be the, the optimal, um, the, the optimal form, it, it seems to be. Um, and, and again, it's just because um, looking at the, the research when we look at um, other populations, it seems, you know, er everybody's vitamin D sufficient to insufficient, you know, as, as far as every population we look at, a large percentage um, is that. So, you know, vitamin D might be one of those things uh, that, you know, supplementation for the vast majority of the population is, is the solution. Uh, especially, um, you know, I didn't touch on this, and I, I probably should have, um, in, in the, you know, African-American community, like any, um, you know, the pigmentation, that, that drops it off uh, significantly, um, so. Mm-hmm. I would have to look and see that the recommendation, and I wouldn't do a blanket recommendation um, because of skin cancer concerns. Maybe there's a history w with a certain individual. I think it'd be very varied. Um, I, I do think those, those recommendations are, are out there. I don't know if it's around like 15 minutes a day, or I've seen some, but I would, I would caution against, you know, because again, you'd have to take each individual. You know, if that individual has a history of, of skin cancer, you know, uh, as we had talked, is it maybe uh, vitamin D supplementation. Um, is, is the best way. And then, especially with soldiers, um, you know, downrange, when do they get that in? Now, I know, you know, some guys go up on the roof and tan, and, and, and that happens at certain locations. Yeah, yeah, so, so I've, you know, I've, I've seen that occur. Uh, however, you know, different locations, that might not always be optimal or, or might, you know, be a good practice uh, to do, especially with incoming. Is there a lawyer in the room? No. Yeah, because I, I, I would be cautious with that, especially depending on what state you're in. I know um, uh, the majority of states, I'm looking at Karen, uh, if you're not a registered dietitian, giving nutrition uh, advice is, is actually, yeah, is, you're setting yourself up for a potential lawsuit. There are some states that... Uh, Right. I, if, 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 it was, if you're asking, you know, Nick Barringer's personal opinion, no legal advice or whatever, I, I would be cautious. I would, um, you know, either talk to somebody or, or the medic, get, get with the medical staff, the physician, you can't go wrong there. Okay, yeah, 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 happy to talk to him, but yeah. I, that, that's, a, that's a state by state um, law, so so it varies what what state you're in. Again, I'm not a lawyer, um, so I, but yeah, so I would look at that. But I know that that's going to vary uh, state to state. Some states no issues. Some states you could get in trouble. Um, so just to be on the you know the cautious side, I, I would look at uh, whatever state you're in, and and look at that to see. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sort of like a 
Yes. Uh, you know, the, the fish oil, the, there's been some discussions about absorption and there's the, the different, you know, with the phospholipids and the ethyl esters. And I, I would say, you know, uh, any reputable uh, company that, that's uh, getting their third party tested, you're probably good to go with. And, and then as far as, you know, make sure that the EPA and DHA levels are, you know, significantly high. You know, if you had a, a supplement that was 100 milligrams of EPA and 100 milligrams of DHA, you know, you're probably not gonna take the whole bottle to try to get enough. So I would look at the, the dosing. And, and fish oil really, um, a lot of dietitians in the back, so if I say something uh, wrong, you know, correct me, but fish oil is the one dietary supplement that I can think of that you kind of get what you pay for in terms of if you, the more expensive fish oils are more concentrated, you get more EPA and DHA, um, which can't be said for a lot of, you know, dietary supplements, usually it's just advertising. Um, but there's a lot of uh, great companies out there. And again, I haven't, you know, most of the studies is with the actual fish oil. They do have uh, algae-based products, and there's also krill-based uh, products that are also available. So, Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I, I don't, I would have to go back and look at that. I, it doesn't jump out at me, but I don't know if they asked that question because, you know, they, they might have missed that. Yeah, maybe everybody in the study was, was wearing sunblock. It was just, yeah, interesting. And, and the same with, like, the Fort Hood soldiers. You, you get plenty of sun, but most of the time you're in uniform, you're, you're covered up, and you're not trying to stand out there. But, but that might be. Maybe it's sunblock is the reason. Yeah, vitamin D is going down. Colonel Canada. More is always better, right? Yeah, moderation's for cowards. Um, it's uh, yes, there. The, the vitamin D. I've seen some studies up to like fifty thousand IU's. Um, so they, they went pretty high. Uh, it would be hard to do, but you can, and, and then you could get some. Um, you know, especially with with vitamin D, the concern would be you could get some. Uh, you know, calcification of of the kidneys. Um, so some, some nasty side effects there you would not want. Um, so that's why I'm not as, as cavalier. There, there is an upper limit. It, it would be difficult uh, to get to. And then kind of with the, the fish oil, the, the, the same thing. I've seen some, you know, going as high as, as 10 uh, grams. And then special situation, like obviously with Dr. Bell's going, you know, 20 grams, et cetera. Um, but uh, one of the, the concerns when you get to those high levels is um, the... Um, uh, delaying the, the, the prothrombin time. So, you know, if you, uh, you, you one of the, the advantages of vitamin D that, that they think can help is, is helping with, with blood flow and, and that sort of thing for lack of, un, you know, unscientific term, thinning the blood. Well, especially with the tactical athlete, if, if they're taking mega doses, we would worry about then if they got shot, shrapnel or whatever, you know, we, we don't want them bleeding faster necessarily. Um, so, so that would be a concern. So, so with any, uh, you know, supplement, it, it's, it's all about the, the dose or any substance to include, you know, water. You know, water's great unless you drink enough to get hyponatremia. Or I liked uh, Lauren uh, Landau's uh, comment about he asked whether, you know, water was, water was good or bad, and everybody says good, and he goes, depends. If you're drowning, it's bad. So <laughs> I'm, I'm still in that one. I'll give him credit now. After a week, I'll make it my own. Any other questions? Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it.